Okay. Wow, we're actually here on a Monday. Woohoo! Amazing. All right, so uh, homework three was due yesterday. Um, I know there were some people burning the midnight oil. Sorry you had to do that, but um, I'll say it again. Start projects early. Uh, I, uh, I actually, not so many ex re requests for extensions, so good job. Either you said, forget it, I don't want to ask him for an extension, or you finished it, which is good. Um, so great. Uh, let's see. Today, we're going to do a couple, thing, a couple things. I'm going to talk a little bit about homework three, not comments, actually. I don't know why that's still up there. Um, homework four is actually out today. It is on binary search trees which I've already kind of warned you about. Uh, but it's a pretty straightforward assignment. You're basically implementing a binary search tree, all the different functions that we talked about last week. Insert, remove, find min, find max, all that stuff, right? What's the hardest one? Remove. That's the trickiest one, OK? Um, this assignment, all the functions are supposed to be recursive. Uh, you're welcome to try it non-recursively. I think the way we built it, it's pretty easy to do recursively. Uh, and trees are, in general, fairly easy to handle recursively. So that's a good thing. Uh, there are something like 30 different tests or something for this one. Uh, we wrote a lot of tests for this one. Well, I wrote a lot of tests for this one. Um, and, uh, and we will, uh, so you'll have to get used to that. Uh, so let's see. That's that. We'll talk about it in a second. We will today go over this strange idea of a copy constructor and an assignment overload. If you were paying attention to Piazza, um, a, a, a lot of people tried to set queues equal to each other, and they, got, they ended up ripping their hair out because of it. Um, a couple people set up their own uh, overloads here, which made things maybe a little bit easier, although that in itself was a bit of a like, struggle anyway. We'll talk about what those are all about. And then today, we will talk also about these things called AVL trees. And they're actually a balanced variety of binary search trees. OK, questions before I get going on this? All right, let's look quickly at the Unix tip of the day. I mentioned this the other day, that when we, can, when we think about trees, you can actually model your directory structure out of a tree. And, or you could model your directory structure with a tree, rather. And you can actually, somebody has written a little program that prints out, uh, pointer issues, that prints out the, your directory in a little tree format, which is kind of neat although not particularly effective all the time. But anyway, if we happen to be in the uh, assignments folder of public HTML for comp15, and we just type ls, you'll get a nice standard ls, like directory listing, right? But if you type tree, you will get this cool listing where it shows you everything in all the folders under there, right? It starts out with homework 0, and it says there's one fo file under there. And then homework 1 has a directory called files, and it and it also has a file called homework1.zip. And files has a bunch of uh, files in them, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see all of these do the same thing. So it gives you a nice little tree output. Kind of neat. Okay? So if you, wanna, if you want to see a full tree listing of all your files, that's the way you do it. Just type tree. And I believe it has some options, too. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's a few, there's, there's a few options. A, D, F, G, H, I, L, blah, 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 blah. So there's a billion options for that. OK, so that's a quick little eclipse tip of the day. I know it's not as fun as cows say. Sorry about that. OK, all right, so let's see. Uh, you can actually ignore all the directories, it looks like, with the dash i flag. And uh, you can, let's see, you can also give you different directories uh, right there if you want as well. Okay. All right, homework three comments. So first of all, Better on memory leaks. I think you guys are getting the idea of this, uh, like, how do you solve memory leaks? Uh, in today's lab, starting today and tomorrow, and in the homework, next homework, you're going to have to handle deleting an entire tree. It's actually pretty easy. All right, you'll practice it in lab today, and then you'll do it uh, in the homework itself. Uh, so as I mentioned, setting two queues equal to each other caused some headaches, right? Because you can't say Q1. Q1 gets Q2 and have it work straight out of the box. You can make it so that it does work if you overload this little equals operation to say, if you see equals to the compiler, if you see equals, 
don't try to do it yourself. Follow my directions, which you will give it explicitly. And there's some there's some like weirdness about doing that, but it's one of the some people call it a strength of C++ that you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to overload this. Other people call it a bane <laughs> because they don't like the idea of not knowing what their equal sign is going to do, etc. Okay, but it's kind of neat when you do that. You can overload almost every operator in C++. You can overload the brackets to do whatever you want. You say your your class and you put brackets on it, it can do something fun. Right? So or a function in your class or whatever. You can have it that. You can overload um, the asterisk to be not multiplication, but if you had two matrices and you wanted matrices and you wanted to multiply them together, you could overload the uh, asterisk uh, operator. So you can do that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I no, you can't add your own symbols to do that. They have to be in there already. The compiler needs to know that. Yeah. Um, would it also break down if you did like student, student get student, like student stuff? Um, as it turns out, we'll talk about why that actually works. Because students have so the compiler knows a little bit. We'll, we'll get to this in a little bit. The compiler knows, hey, I'll try to make a copy of everything that I can for you. The problem is when you have things like pointers that point to an address, it's not going to go to that address and copy all those things. It's just going to copy the pointer. So you can end up with copies of the wrong things. It'll try the best it can. And sometimes with students, it works. But with things like queues, because they've got pointers in there, it won't work. So those, that's the big difference. Yes? Right, you can't. Can't do that. Can't overload an operator that doesn't already exist. As far as I know, I, but I don't think you can anyway. But anyway, we'll get into that detail. So we'll do that a little bit today. We'll actually talk about how to go about doing this. And it is powerful, but you do have to understand why. And there are a little bit of syntax issues you have to get used to. OK? All right, we'll talk about that. Now, homework four. As I said, this is a pretty straightforward assignment. All right, it's basically implement a binary search tree. Nothing too fancy about it. It's not like you have to think about a lot of logic in terms of like the course thing. Like that was kind of a bigger idea of going, okay, I'm modeling this this uh, ISIS course or this class at, at Tufts, etc. And how do I do it? This is like just down to the nuts and bolts of putting together the functions necessary to do a binary search tree. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, the original due date, I have pushed it out a little bit. It was going to be due. Next Wednesday, maybe? I pushed it to Friday, so I gave you a couple extra days. Um, but it's, uh, it's still not, uh, it's, it's actually about two weeks, so it's not too bad. You've got, you've got enough time. Just don't try not to start it late. You'll still have a bunch. Remember, recursive functions are harder to debug in general, right? So be careful on that. Okay, and there is some logic. Like the remove function is not particularly easy. Remember, there's three cases. You have to remove if it's a, if it's a leaf. You have to remove if there's one child. You have to remove if there's two child, children. And if there's two children, it gets especially tricky, right? Because you have this weird, like, find the minimum of the right child, et cetera. So there's, there's definitely some lengthy code, but straightforward. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, you are going to have to build an assignment overload. OK, uh, I don't know if you have to build a com copy constructor, which is the other type of this, but you definitely have to build an assignment overload, and we will test that. OK? All right, let's see. What else about, oh, I forgot on homework three. So how many people had to resubmit after I added those two other tests? Like they had, they had some, some issue, right? OK, what does that tell me, or what does that, should that tell you about your own coding practices? Yeah? You weren't testing your own code enough, right? Just because I left out a test doesn't mean you shouldn't have made sure your program's working appropriately, right? Now, the person that happened to come in, you should anonymously thank this person because that person didn't want to be like mentioned, but uh, who came in and we found this said, you better not be mean and like not include these in the test. So that's why I sent you that, that Piazza post. But point is, you've got to do your own testing too, OK? My, own, my concern with this class is, Sometimes, um, oh, by the way, if you have concerns about this class in lab today or beforehand, it doesn't matter to me, please fill out the uh, midterm surveys for the class, OK? Constructive feedback is always welcome, OK? Non-constructive feedback just makes me a little sad. But um, <laughs> constructive feedback is always welcome. Um, as, far as, uh, uh, as far as my concerns about this class is sometimes I feel like sometimes we almost give you too much. 
like in the provide test, right? We say, well, look, you failed this, go fix it, instead of you having to think about these things yourself, right? In real life, when you build your own program, you have to build your own tests because nobody's going to be doing the test for you. And you certainly don't want your like, end user to email you and say, hey, this is broken. Why is it broken? Oh, I forgot to test that. Right? I mean, that happens, but you want to avoid that. right? So, um, so I, I, I do give you guys a lot of tests to kind of show you how to do this. But please do your own testing. For everybody who raised their hand, say, oh, why didn't I test that myself? OK, that's that. All right, questions on that? I'm not, not yelling at you. I'm suggesting. <laughs> right? OK. Uh, all right, uh, homework four. You can see it online. Any questions, obviously put them on Piazza or email me. Okay. Uh, the other thing about binary search tree implementation, this is actually kind of fun to do. I, I, went, I didn't make this up myself. Um, I modified it so that it would work with our assignment. But when you do the provide tests, you will actually get, or when you actually do the test, you can actually have it print what's called pretty print the tree for you. So it'll actually come out in ASCII text and look like the tree that you've created, which is kind of nice to debug, right? Because you can go, oh, wait a minute. This, this is not a real tree because 10 was over here somewhere. And it's, it's not a binary search tree because 10 was over here. And it should be greater than 8. So you'll be able to like, like, phys like visually see it, which is kind of nice. Here's what we've done. I've modified it so that when you do duplicates, any duplicates of, of two or more will be designated with an asterisk. Okay, So in this case, this means we have at least two fives in here, at least two eights. Under the covers, you will keep track of exactly how many. Okay, And when you add another eight, it would just update this. If you added a nine to this, it would update this with a little asterisk, because there'd be more than one nine. Okay, You don't have to worry about the asterisks part. You just have to worry about the fact that you will have to keep track of, of, of duplicates. Okay, Make sense? All right, so this is kind of a, it's a I, I think it's an easier way to do some of the debugging. Yes? Does the underscore before the 7 mean? Does the underscore before the 7, we just, the way the little pretty printing thing works, it tries to get it uh, evenly distributed text wise. So maybe it doesn't always work exactly. So it doesn't mean anything particular. It's just, hey, I'm trying to make it so that it's, you know, be exactly between this eight, 8 there. You know what I mean? That's all. So no other sneaky stuff in there. All right, um, there is one test which puts like thousands of nodes in your tree. We're trying to test that, that everything works. And it looks terrible on the screen because it can't format it right. If you really want to format it, if you want to figure out, copy the whole thing into a text editor and set the no line breaks. And it will then, you can kind of scroll around. It's not easy, but you'll be able to see. That's really only one test, though. Okay. All right, you'll see when you get, again, you get to testing it. Um, I did provide you the actual output for one of the tests, or for the initial main, straight away. So you can at least test your own main and see if it works. Right. OK. Now, on to these things. Now, some people, when teaching this class, they say, uh, I hate the fact that I have to teach these things, because it's kind of a weird C++ only thing. And it's not really data structures, but you do have to understand it, because otherwise your code won't necessarily work the way it is. So we will go over these things. And they are, keep in mind, this is like a very C++ specific topic. The big three. In C++, we have been talking about destructors a lot. Okay? The destructor cleans up after your code. right? It basically says anything that you used the new keyword on that still remains at the end of your program ends up having to, you have to, you have to use delete to get rid of it. This is particularly important for a tree where you've got all these nodes that you've created individually, and you have to go through and delete them all. OK? Uh, there's this all other thing called a copy constructor and an assignment overload. They both do very similar things. OK? They make it so that you can say either Q1 gets Q2, that's for the assignment overload, or if you say something like Q and then Q2 gets Q1, slightly different thing going on. In the first case here, Q1 already exists. So before you set Q2 equal to it, you have to clean up Q1. In this one, you're creating a whole nother new Q2, so you don't have to do the cleanup part. Okay, Slight difference in here. Same function, though. Basically, makes Q2 a copy of Q1 correctly. And correctly is what you determine is correctly. Okay, so. 
That's basically what I just said. Constru copy constructor creates a new copy of a class and copies the old copy to the new one. Too many uses of the word copy in that sense. Assignment overload copies one class to another copy that was previously created. So this was already created. And I did have these backwards, I guess. Q2 gets Q1 if that one already exists. OK. All right. So that's, um, that's what we're about to do. OK, let's take a look at some of these things. Let's use an example. Now, there's a, there seems like there's a lot of code on here, and I crammed it all into one page so it would fit. But let's go through what this is. This is just a generic class called an int cell. Okay? And in here, we've got a, obviously, we've got public functions and private functions. The only pr and this is a stupid class. <laughs> I'll tell you up front. This is kind of a dumb class. It basically just stores an integer for you. Why would you want to do that? You wouldn't. But let's say that you did. <laughs> okay? You might want to do something more advanced, like, oh, I don't know, create a queue. Right? And you can, what it does is, this is just boilerplate that says, look, if you don't give it an initial value, the initial value is 0. That's all that means. It's another special thing. But what it does in the constructor, and I put all this on one page again, not the best coding standard, but put it all on one page. The constructor says uh, the stored value get, creates a new integer pointer right, of the initial value that you pass in. So you can use this class by saying the following. You can say int cell 3, and that will give you an int cell class with the value in stored value of 3. Notice something about stored value. It is a pointer to an integer. Okay, So let's just write this down here. Here's our, here's our stored value pointer. And this is the little box that we're going to point it to. Okay? When the program begins, before the constructor is called, where is stored value point to? Before the program even begins. Any ideas? Yeah. Clear. What's that? It's not pointed to null. You would think that. If you were writing in Java, it would be pointed to a null value or something. In C, it's what? Someplace. Someplace random. It's just a random, random location. It's a dead squirrel using comp 11 terms, right? So when the program starts, there is no box here, and stored value points off into nowhere. Okay. When, you cr when the constructor is called stored value, what you do is you create the box. You basically ask for the box from memory. And you say, give me a location, and then, and then put the initial value there. Let's say it was 3. And then point our stored value to that location. Okay. Does everybody see how that works? That's it. We're just, it's, it's kind of a dumb example, but we're going to use this just to see what, what it's like. We've also got get value, which returns the value at stored value. Get value goes to where stored value is pointing and gives, gets the value back. And then set value allows you to actually go into where the stored value points and change the value. Easy to do. Okay? All right. Let's see what main does here. Okay? Actually, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to look through this. And this, by the way, so this creates an int cell with the initial value of 2 th and called A. This creates an, a, uh, an int cell called B with the value of, what, of A. In other words, it creates a copy of B or a copy of A called B. This one just creates a, not a copy, a, an int cell called C that does not have any, uh, th sorry, that's got the default value of 0. Okay, And then we do some other logic down here. I want you to talk to your neighbor and tell me what this prints out. Okay, So talk amongst yourselves for a couple minutes. And I'll start drawing some other things on the board here.
Okay, it got quiet all of a sudden. Who can tell me what this prints out? Raise your hands. What do you think? Actually, four, two, two. Okay. Anybody else have a different answer? Yeah. Say again. Four, two, and then something random. Okay. Four, two, and then who knows what? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Four, four, four. four, four. Okay, so there's different ideas here about what, anybody else? Okay, let's walk through this and see what actually happens. Okay, all right, we create an int cell with the de default value of 2. That gives us a box, puts a 2 in there, and a stored value points to. Everybody get that? Okay, then you create an int cell with the value of a. Okay. So what this does is this actually, because the compiler doesn't really know what to do, okay, the compiler goes and it says, compiler goes, okay, store, B gets its own set of things. One of its things is a stored value. That stored value gets created or gets copied directly from the stored value, in other words, the pointer called stored value. So where does B actually point right now? It turns out that B points to the same box as there because it gets its, its, its own B-like box, but it copies the pointer for stored value. It doesn't go into the pointer and copy to it. It doesn't have any new value of like, it doesn't create a new box. There is no more new happening here. OK. All right, how about C? When I do int cell C, what is where does it what does it do? Any ideas? We don't really know. Yeah, this one this one's a little tricky, but it does when you say int cell C, it does create its own little box. All right? And it gives the value the default value, which happens to be what? 0. Zero. Okay? All right. So this is where we start at. Okay? This is where we start at. Okay? And then it says C gets B. And what that does is C gets B says, OK, I want to take all the values from B and change them to be C. Okay? So what happens here? Any ideas? A little tricky, yeah. Yeah, the stored value here ends up doing that. And first things first, what have you, what have you done? Memory leak. Memory leak, right? That one can never get like, deleted because and the compiler will try to, but it'll actually end up deleting that one, as it turns out. Okay? So, so that'll do that. And then we say set the value of a to 4, which goes into the box a points at and changes it to 4, like that. And then you print everybody out, which one gets printed? Four, four, four. Okay. Yes. Question. Yeah. Exactly. This is a very good point. If that was just an integer, now this is the way you'd really do it. Like you wouldn't really do this anyway. But if you really were to do this, if you don't have a pointer and you just have a value, the compiler says. I can copy values just fine. It really is copying a value. It's copying the address, right? So it is copying a value, but the address happens because it's a pointer, it will point to, it'll copy the address of that box up there. So that's what ends up happening. Yeah. Why does it work to say in cell B and then you had to put in in cell? Uh no, this actually tells the compiler if this is a another class or if this is another class instance, make a copy of it. That's the terminology in C++. So that's actually a C++ thing. That'll work for any class, yeah. Well, you'll try for any class. Won't, it'll do that for any class. Won't necessarily do what you want, but that'll do it. Yeah? And then default, uh, default copy constructor behavior only works for primitive data types? Yes, default, that's a very good way of putting it. Default copy constructor only works for primitive types. Now, a primitive type happens to be an int pointer is a primitive type in the sense that that's a value, it's just another integer. Right? And so it will copy the pointer, but it won't dig down in deep into it and copy what's inside it. And so say you were using a, a C++ uh, class that's like a vector. 
mm -hmm. uh, that had a built-in copy constructor. Would yes. You use that copy constructor. Okay. Yes. The the built-in things like vectors, which we haven't learned about, strings. You can say string one equals string two, or string one gets string two because there's a copy constructor. Actually, because there's an operator overload in general. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So Yes, if you if you have a a an op, an, if you have a class like a string, it will do that for you because the people who built strings said, "Whoa, people want to do this, so we'll build a copy constructor for it." Okay? Or an assignment overload. Okay. So, we can go through this. We, can, we already went through what all this does, and you end up getting 444, four, four, and that's probably not what you wanted. Now, it might have been. Maybe that's really what you wanted, right? This behavior. You definitely didn't want a memory leak here, but maybe you wanted something something else. Yeah. Yes, it will generate a memory leak because of the C getting re redone. Okay, so that's not so good. Okay, but that's what prints out. Now, how do we solve this? Well, we can do a couple things. Now, this is a, whoa, this is a this is a lot of code here. Well, it's not that much code really, but the only thing that I've really changed, in fact, the literally the only thing that I've changed, is I have added two functions here. Okay, I've added this function and this function. The top function up here. I wonder if I highlighted it. Hang on. Yes. This is the copy constructor. Okay? Now, there's a couple things in here. We looked at some of these in lab last week. Const means that you're not allowed to change something, right? So whatever this is, you're not allowed to change it. Here's how this works. Okay? When you say int cell b parentheses a or by the way, you could also say the following. I believe it still calls the copy constructor. You could say this. You could say int cell b gets a that's the same same idea okay i believe it does the same thing i'm not 100% sure that it calls a copy constructor but in definitely in this case it will call the copy constructor now let's look at a couple terminal a little bit of terminology here so this is a this is a constructor just like another constructor it's another constructor how many constructors can you have in a class and then as you want, right? This one happens to be a particular one called the copy constructor because C++ said, "Oh, we have people do this, so let's make a definite one called the copy constructor." It does not take a return value, have a return value because constructors don't return values. Okay? And here's what it does. It says, "Give me another int cell fixed." Okay? This time we're talking about int cell fixed instead of int cells. "Give me another int cell fixed." called the source and make it a reference to a source and that means you can use it directly the reason we have const in there is so that you can say oh don't change it in other words in your copy constructor when you say int cell b we'll do it this way when you say int cell b a you are not allowed to change a because you're making a copy of it and you don't want anybody to be able to change the one you're making a copy of that would be weird okay so you're not allowed to do that so this says give me another int cell fix that i'm going to copy and make the copy so here's how it does that it says fine i am a brand new class i'd better create a box for myself here's the box to do stored value it creates a new integer location then it says give me the one that you passed in's stored value the actual value and put it in my stored value end of story okay this takes a couple times to see when you like to to get it under like in your brain but that's all it's doing it's basically making a legitimate copy what is it doing if this is a oops a, well if this is a's stored value 3, right? This says, "Okay, I'm creating b and I'm going to give stored value a new box of its own, and then I'm going to go and that's the new line here, and then I'm going to go in and copy the stored value at the source, which is a, into my own box." Like that. Okay? Does that make sense? What's going on there? Okay. So that's the copy constructor. 
The assignment overload is this one where I said, oh, whenever you see something like C gets A, and this is an int cell fixed, and this is an int cell fixed, it's going to say, hey, call this function. And here's how you do this. You, you do this operator equals, and that's called overloading the equal sign. That's all it's doing, OK? You're overloading the equal sign. The, this returns the actual reference to a, an int cell fixed. Why? Have you ever seen does anybody do anything like this? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. A gets B gets C. You ever done that? Ever seen that? That is allowed in C and C++. What it means is whatever C is first goes into B, and then B returns something. It returns the value of itself so that A can get it. See how that works? It's exactly what's happening when you're returning an int cell fixed. It happens to be a reference again so that you can get, op you can get access to the original. That's the way it goes. Okay, And what it's doing now is it's saying, OK, again, same thing. Give me the source that I'm copying from. And you're not allowed to change it. That's what const is all about. This part is interesting. This little keyword, this, means the one that's getting, like, doing the calling. Okay, If I say C gets A, which, ones do, which one are we in here, A's or C's? Which one is going to get the new, like which one's going to make get changed, changed in this case? C. That's this. It's actually a keyword that's called this. Okay? This is A, and in this case, actually, source, or this, this one is C, and source is A, like that. Okay? So we've got A is the source, and this is the one that we're doing the copying into. Okay? All right, so what we have to do is we have to check first and say, whoa, 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 don't do any changes, OK? Don't make any changes if, uh, if we have this weird thing where we've said something bizarre like A gets A. Could you say that in C++? You're actually allowed to. Would you ever want to? Probably not. I suppose there might be a compiler optimization that does something like that. I don't know why, but sometimes it might do that. This is allowed in C++. You wouldn't want to do it necessarily because it would be silly, but you're allowed to do it. Yeah? So would you have to overload the, I guess, not equal to operator for working by data type? I guess that should work. Would you have to overload the not equal? Remember, this is making a copy. Not equals is just, just checking differences. Yeah, you probably would. If you, if you wanted to do is A equals equals C, that's going, to change, uh, that's going to check the addresses, not the, in, not the inner parts of the class. Yeah, It gets a little bit more detailed, but yes, you would want to do that. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. Um, is the, the ampersand before the word operator in there, that's just because it's revealing the pointer to the right? This is not a pointer. It's a reference. This is a reference. So it's kind of like a pointer, but in lab last week we talked about references. Okay. It means you get access to the original. So it's okay. The ampersand is always going to be there for, for operator overloads and copy constructors. Yes, you have to make this that look just like this. OK. Now, keep another question? My second question was, um, so can you overload any symbol? Mo you can overload most symbols. There's a couple that you're not allowed to, but most of them you can. Cool. Yep, most of them you can. Yes, so. Source is the one you're copying from. So when you say C gets A, a ends up being the source that you're going to make a copy of. No, it's actually, it could be anything. Sometimes you see it has RHS standing for right hand side, like the right hand side versus the left hand side. Sometimes you see that, just depends. Yeah, it will because, yeah, when you do equals, it says, okay, this one's going to be the source, and this one's going to be the this, and it knows by, by definition of what equals does. Okay? All right. Now, I just noticed something here. There's a bit of a memory leak here, right? If you've already got C, doesn't it already have a stored value that it created up here? So didn't I forget to do delete stored value here? Yeah. So you've got to be a little bit careful with that. I, I goofed when I, when I wrote this one, right? You have to, do, you have to delete that. Okay? You have to delete the stored value there. Uh, second thing, okay? 
This is now just going to make the copy. The, the, the box already exists. In other words, C already has a box. So um, in, well, you know, actually, in this case, you don't need the new because you're going to use the same box. In other cases, you might need it. So I guess this is a little bit, it's a little bit hazy in this case. You could do it either way, create a new box or not. But if you don't create a new box, this is what happens. C, which already has its own box, you're just going to replace the value in there. And so that's what this does. This says stored value, uh, the, what's at the address stored value is going to get what's at the address of sources stored value, which happens to be 3 in this case. So it would be that way. So, so I, you could do it either way. More advanced data structures you are going to need to clean up after this one first, then create the next one. Okay? And then remember how we have to return something. Guess what? We return the value at this, which is basically C's object, because this is a pointer to C. So we're returning this out. And you will always see it in this form. So you're going to always return star this. And up here, uh, that, yeah, that's it. You're going to do the if this is not equal to a ampersand source. OK? That's about it for the constructor. Yes, Kalina. Uh huh. So remember, when this gets called, when equals gets called, this already exists. I had to create it earlier at some point, so that's where I got the new. Some point earlier in the program. Now, let's look at the program. Let's see the rest of the program here. Okay. For the rest of the program. Okay. Let's. Here's the program here. We've we create a box for two or for a. We put two in it. Then we say, give me a real copy of A and make it B. That calls the copy constructor. Okay, and it creates a new box for our stored value for B. And then it copies the value into B. I'll draw this on the board in a second. Okay, and then we create a new C. This is where the first constructor gets called up here. That's where you get the box from. And then we then call C gets B, which we've overloaded this equals. So therefore, it calls the operator overload equals overload. And it makes the actual copy there. It copies the value of B into the value of C stored value. OK? Whew. Question? So if you go down the header file or? Uh, that's a good question. You can put them in either. You can do the same. You can, in this case, I put them in the kind of both. I mean, this really is a thing. But generally, you'd put the actual function in the file, just the header in the header file, which means you'd do in self fix, constant self fix, semicolon here in the header file. OK? Yes? Um, when does the operator overload thing take effect? Only when you're dealing with in self fix? In this case, yeah, because what is it? It's just like any other function. If you call, Equals, it has going to say, am I using an incel fixed when I, do equal, when I do equals here? That's an incel fixed, and that's an incel fixed. Oh, I can call the incel fixed equals overload. Good question. OK. All right. So that's this. Now, this one, what does this one print out? Sorry, Zoe, you had a question? When I do this, this calls the copy constructor because B does not yet exist. B does not yet exist. I'm in the middle of declaring it. That's when a constructor gets called when you're declaring something. This one, I declare C here. Later on in the program, one line later, but later on in the program, I set it equal to B. C already exists. When C already exists, you call the overload. When it doesn't exist yet, you call the copy constructor. Okay? Question? Am I using which one? Uh, am I use store? No. Stored value is the stored value component. Sorry, in private here, it's the stored value private variable. This points to the whole object itself, which happens to be in our case called C. The whole object itself is this. Okay. I know it's confusing, and I apologize about that on behalf of everybody who's ever coded in C before, or whoever created the language. Mm. Okay. All right. So that's that. Let's talk about. Let's just see what this does. Let me see if I can bring this up just a little. Uh, yeah, we'll do it right here. 
this creates, uh, I'll do it this way. All right, first things first. Okay, we same thing as before. We create a, a box for A, and we have A's stored value. Stored value gets its own box, which has a 2 in it. We make a, an actual real copy of A into B. So we have B, right? We create a new place to hold an integer for B's stored value. Gets its own box, and then we make the copy. Stored value at the source, which is A, goes into the stored value of B. The value 2 goes there. Then we create a C like this. We say C, which has a stored value. And it calls the original constructor, which gets a new value of 0. Right? It gets its own box, which is a value of 0. And then we say C gets B. So we, this now calls the assignment overload, which says, OK, fine. We are not saying B gets B or C gets C. And then we just say, OK, fine, put the stored value at B into the stored value of C. So that changes this to 2. And now we can say, set the value of A to 4. Does that change anybody else's value? No, which is probably what you wanted. right? And then we print everybody out. A prints out 4, B prints out 2, C prints out 2. Okay. Yay. Questions on that? You'll have to do something similar to, the, to this for the, uh, you'll have to do something similar to this for the tree. You definitely want to clean up for yourself here. You, before this line, you would do delete the tree, original tree. And then you'd create, well, actually, well, yeah, then you'd go one by one through this tree's nodes and create new and add new values. Okay? It's a little bit tricky, but it's not too, too bad once you do it a couple times. Question? So if you're doing things like arrays and trees, you have to go through each value? Yes. If this was an array, if this stored value was an array, which, by the way, it really is an array, it's an array of how many values? 1. It's an array of 1. If it was an array of 20, you would have to go through and do a for loop here and say i equals 0, i goes to 20, i plus plus, and copy every one into the proper position. Right? And that's why you'd, need a, you'd also need a new keyword to create a new box, a new array for c, et cetera. Okay? Good question. Yes? Um, why do you have to make a new one instead of replacing the values? Uh, it dep well, it depends. Let's say you had a tree that had, let's say that. Let's say this was, these were trees, and A had 50 elements, and then you said C gets A, and, a, and C only had one. Then you need to make new ones in that case. Okay. All right. I know this is confusing. I apologize. But it's a C++ thing. It's actually kind of interesting when you think about what's going on behind the scenes. But it is definitely one of those syntactical ideas that's kind of hard to wrap your head around the first couple times you see it. But Camille, it wasn't too bad, right? OK. Camille was one of the people who did, did do that, and, it, and she did great on it. So um, it's possible to do it. OK? All right, other questions on that? OK, if you need help on that, come to Office Hours. We'll help you walk you through it. OK? And, uh, or put something on Piazza. Check the examples here. There are lots of good references on Google that show you how to do this. It's, it's something that pe people have done a lot of, so you'll get it. OK? The Q1, we don't need to go through the details of this, but basically, same idea. Down here, you're going to have this issue with Q3 gets Q1, and you've got to have a copy constructor called. That's a lie. That's calling the, oh, this is calling the copy constructor because Q3 does not exist yet. This one calls the assignment overload because Q4 already exists. I was going to make you actually draw, write these out, but it's not worth trying to do in class. Do it on your own. Okay. The problem with this is, this is what we call needing a deep copy. In other words, a queue has a, an array in it, like you were talking about, has an array in it that you need to make a copy of. You don't want the pointers to point to each other. Okay? Everybody who had a double, that dreaded double free issue probably did something like this, and, and it broke because basically when this one ended, 
it deleted its array, and this one still had an array, which was the same array, <laughs> right? So it, it, it breaks it. Okay. We need a deep copy. And I will let you write that on your own or see it here. But basically, you do that, right? You, uh, this is a copy constructor. Notice in here, the cop well, the copy constructor does the same thing, creates a new, it basically copies all the different parts. Copies all the different parts, then goes through the array, like we were talking about, to copy it all, and then sets everybody appropriately. Okay. The assignment overload does the same thing too. It, it cleans up after itself, then it creates a new one, create, gets the, sets the capacities right. Uh, sorry, down here creates a new one. Uh, and then it, does the, it copies everybody and then sets everything together. Okay. So that'll work too. Whew. Enough of that horrible C++ stuff. Not too bad once you get used to it. OK. Back to the next topic, which I think is a little more, uh, also a little tricky. These are, this is like tricky day in data structures. But uh, we talked yesterday, or we talked on uh, Thursday, I guess it was, about binary search trees can be degenerate, right? They can be where you have, a, uh, you have values that go, let's see, for binary search trees. You could have a binary search tree that goes two. What's, what's this one have to be? Relative to two. Bigger than it, right? Four, six, seven, et cetera. Right? That's a degenerate tree. This ends up looking like a linked list if you're trying to go through it. But the thing is, with binary search trees, we want to make them efficient, meaning we want them to be relatively balanced. Okay? A balanced binary search tree is A, easy to maintain. You don't want to have to do the following. You don't want to say, I have to rebalance this tree, take everything out, and then put everything back in by inserting. That would be inefficient. Okay? We also want to ensure that the depth of the tree is what we say on the order of log n, n being the number of nodes in it. Okay? The way we keep things being the, on the order of log n is we keep it balanced. Okay? We keep the whole tree relatively balanced. We could just say, fine, how might I rewrite this? Let's put one more in here. Eight. How might I rewrite that? That's a terrible eight. It almost looks like an infinity. Oh well. Anyway, um, that's an eight. <laughs> How would I rewrite this so that it's actually much more balanced? Yeah. Ben. Yeah. Right. Roughly in half. You've got six. You've got seven. You've got eight. You've got four, and you've got two. Something like that. You could recreate it like that. That's roughly balanced. The problem with that is that it, you could end up looking like this. And guess what? That's not much better. That's better by a factor of two, but it's not much better. This is a balanced tree from the roots perspective, but it's certainly not a balanced subtree from four's perspective. Four just looks like a linked list. Six looks like a linked list. The only one that's balanced in this whole tree is five. Okay, so this is actually one of those cases where uh, you can make it perfectly balanced from one node's perspective, the root, but it's not a particularly good balanced tree. Okay, what we can do instead, okay, you could insist that we have a tree where all the nodes are perfectly balanced. Every node has two, uh, one on both sides. Guess what? That would satisfy the condition, but it's too rigid. First of all, you could only have balanced trees with 2 to the n minus 1. Or sorry, 2, yeah, it should be with 2 to the n minus 1 nodes would satisfy the condition. Okay? It would be hard to do, and it would be hard to maintain that because it just turns out that it's not easy to make it nice and balanced like this. All right. Well, we have this other idea. There are these three guys. I forget their last names, but they, their last names start with A, V, and L. Okay. Oh, here they are, right here. Uh, sorry, two guys. 
Allison Velsky and Landis, I guess this guy kind of got double value out of his name in this case. Um, they, uh, these two guys came up with this idea and it said, fine, <clears throat> we can't make a perfectly balanced tree. It's too much work. Like we could, but it'd be too much work and it would be inefficient. Instead, let's simplify it just a little bit and say that for every node, every node, the height of the left and right subtrees can differ only by one amount. Okay. You will see this in various values, that an empty tree has a height of negative 1 or 0. Depends. That is not too important in right now. Let's look. This is an AVL tree. What is the height of the right subtree of 5? I just like to count jumps. 1, 2. What is the height of the left subtree of 5? 1, 2 on this one, but that's not the height. It's the maximum one we care about. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2 versus 1, 2, 3. Do they differ by only one? At most one? This is an AVL tree. And you can look at the other nodes too. What's the two? Left, left subtree is 1, hop. Right subtree is 1, 2. Differs by more than one? No, so it's OK. 8. Left subtree is 1. Right subtree is 0. It's OK. Make sense? All right, so th that's what an AVL tree is. This one, why is this one not an AVL tree? What's this? You say the maximum height's three. Which which node is miss uh, is is off? Let's see. Seven is definitely off. One is the right side, and one, two, three is the left. That's off by more than one. It's bad. Let's see about the other ones. Is two wrong? One versus one, two. No, nope, two's okay actually. How about four? No, one and one. And eight is zero and zero, so it's fine. So the only one that we care about in this case is seven is off because you've got one on one side and one, two, three on the other side. Question, Jenny? Well, we're calling it a negative one. It, sometimes it makes it easier to say uh, an empty tree because it has no nodes at all. So we'll just say no nodes is negative one, which is okay. All right. Okay. All right, so that's the difference. Now, we need to figure out how to make this actually balanced, OK? Just like binary search trees, we can insert into it. In fact, you start by doing exactly that. You insert into a binary search tree, or an AVL tree, exactly like you do into a binary search tree. In fact, an AVL tree is a binary search tree. But it's just got an extra invariant that says every node's left subtree must differ by no more than one from its right subtree, the height. Okay? All right. So we have, but then once we, once we actually insert, you have to make it balanced because you can break the AVL property by inserting, and then all of a sudden one, one node might be, or one subtree might be longer than the other subtree, and you've got a problem. Okay? But, but to maintain that AVL tree is a little bit tricky. We're going to learn how to do it. These smart people, A and v, A, V, and L, figured it out, right? Uh, but let's say if we inserted 6 into this tree, okay, if we insert 6 into this tree, what does it look like? Let's see. We've got 5, 8, 7, 2, 1, Four, three, and so so far is this an AVL tree? You have to check every node. One, two, one, two, three, good. One, two, one, good. One, zero, good. Zero, zero, good. Zero, zero, good. One, zero, good. Okay, you'll get better at that when you practice it. <laughs> okay, we insert six. Where's six going to go? Which side of seven? To the left of seven. If it's bigger than five, it's less than eight, it's less than seven, it's going to go right here. If we do that, who gets broken? Eight gets broken. Does five get broken? One, two, three. One, two, three. Five's fine. As far as five's concerned, it's still fine. But eight, zero, and one, two is broken. Okay? So we have to deal with that. All right? We have to deal with that. How do we deal with that? Well, we have these things called rotations. Okay, we have these things called rotations. 
once you learn how to do rotations, you'll go, oh, is that all? Right? But you got to learn how to do it. And it's a little bit tricky, and it takes a couple times seeing it before you get it. I'll try to go, go through this and so that you can get it. Okay? But after the insertion, only the nodes on the path from the insertion might have their balance. In other words, the only way you could up, if, if this was an AVL tree, which it was, and you insert six, only these nodes could be upset. You don't have to worry about this side in terms of anything here being upset, because we haven't changed anything here. This side could be upset versus this side, but in terms of the only ones we have to care about is this one, this one, this one, and this one going up to the root. You don't have to go back down the other side. So that's nice. Okay. But we're gonna, what we're going to do is rebalance as we go up. Basically, we check each one. Now, you keep the details along, going along. You keep what your left and right subpass heights are in the tree node so you don't have to calculate it every time. Just makes it easier. So what we do is we start at 6 and we say 0 and 0, that one's fine. Then we go to 7 and we go 0 and 1, that one's fine. We go to 8 and we go 0, 1, 2, up 8 is the problem. Okay? Once you make a rotation and fix 8, that's the only one you're going to ever have to make, as it turns out. Although you'll read different, different opinions about that. I've never been able to show that you could do one rota a rotation and still upset it. So we'll, we'll see why that happens in a minute. Okay? All right. A couple of ideas here. Any node only has most two children. Okay? A height imbalance means that that node's two subtrees differ by two now. They can't differ by more than two. If they differed by more than two, you wouldn't have started with an AVL tree. Okay? So the only way they can differ by, they can only differ by up to two because you would have been a broken AVL tree before if they differed by more than two. So they can only differ by more than two. So what we can do, there can be four different cases of these violations. Don't worry, they're symmetrical, so really you only have to worry about two of them. You can insert in the left subtree of the left child. If 8 gets upset, which it did, we inserted into the left subtree of the left child. Does that make sense? You see how that works? 8 got upset. So we, it got, the, the AVL property got changed. So we inserted in the left subtree of the left child, the left child's left subtree. That's one case. You could have inserted into the right subtree of the left child. In other words, let's say we had upset this by putting 7.5 in. 7.5 would go right here. And wouldn't 7.5 be in the left subtree's right child, or the right, the right subtree of the left child, I should say. The right subtree of the left child of 8. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, that's OK. I know we're going a little quickly on this. These cases 3 and 4 are the symmetrical varieties. The left subtree of the right child, or the right subtree of the right child. Okay. Left subtree of the right child of A. If we were to insert, let's say this was 9, and we we're into the left subchild, uh, the left subtree of the right child of A. If we were to upset 8 and we put in 8.5, that would be the left subtree of the right child of 8. If we wanted to do the other one, which is the right subtree of the right child, we could insert 10, and that would be a problem. Okay? that make sense? OK. Back up a step. The only thing we're trying to do here is keep this tree relatively balanced. If we keep it relatively balanced, we make it so that when we search through it, it's logarithmic. That's the basic idea. OK? All right. For the outside cases, in other words, the left left or right right, we can do what we call a single rotation, which I will show you in a minute. For the other cases, the left, right, right, left ones, we have to do this thing called a double rotation. It's not much harder, it's just a little different. Okay? You, do, you do a rotation twice. I'll show you what a rotation is. Sometimes I think this is a little more confusing than it needs to be. Nodes here are circles. 
subtrees are triangles. In other words, the way this works, this could be like much bigger down, the, down, down. But right now we're just saying, look, k2 and k1 are like nodes. And then subtrees of those nodes go down enough so that they differ by z is one level above y, which is one level above x. That's all that means. Don't stress about the details. It all does work out. K2. Let's look here at K2's issue. How big is its right subtree? One. How big is its left subtree? One, two, three. Because remember, this is like a subtree, and it goes all the way down to this level. OK, that's all I mean by this. Even though it looks, it might have been just as good to do this with actual circles for everybody, but for now, you'll, you'll pick it up. K2, one versus one, two, th- one. Two, three. Okay? Now, what we want is we want this. We basically want k1 to be the root now, k2 to have y and z as its children, and this side of the subtree will be at the same level as y and z. Okay? There's a trick to doing this, and I'll show you on a, a real tree in a minute. Well, actually, well, we'll get there to real trees in a minute. Okay? To doing this, what you need to do is you need to say, fine, k2 is the problem. Which way does k2 need to go? To the left or to the right? You need to rebalance this to the right because k2 is left heavy, so let's m- rotate things to make it less, to make it more balanced. Okay? More stuff needs to be over on this side than is on this side now. Okay. Watch how we do this. Here's a visualization for you. I wish I could like do animations and whatever, right? Grab K1 and hold it up and pull it up. How do you, what, is the, what, what is the relationship between K2 and K1? Which one's bigger? K2 has to be bigger. Which one's bigger between K2 and the Zs? OK, all the Zs are bigger. Everything in the Z subtree is bigger than K2. Everything in Y related to K2. Smaller. Everything y related to k1. Y, y is greater than k1. OK, you get that? If we grab onto k1 and pick it up like we're shaking it, let's think about what happens. k1 gets picked up. I'm gonna, I'll draw it over here. k1 gets picked up like this and shaken. k2 we know is bigger than k1. So which side of k1 does it need to go on? To the right side. Oops. There we go. K, that's what happens when I get new chalk. K2, OK. K2 is there. Now, Z is bigger than K2. Which side of K2 does Z go on? Right side. Whoops. Should do it like a triangle like I'm doing on the board. OK. And Y related to K2 is what? Less than. So it needs to go here. And the only thing left is x, which we don't even need to really change. But if we're grabbing k1 and pulling it up, x happens to be like this and is now on the left side of k2 or k1, and we have balanced it. Okay, we will see some real examples in a minute. Some other examples of bigger trees. Okay, grab the node that you, not the one that's out of balance, the one that needs to get, ro- like, that needs the, be above the one that needs to get rotated. This one is the one we rotate right. So therefore, you grab the one on its left and you shake it. And everything falls out underneath according to the rules of binary search trees. Okay, Here's a real example. We put 6 in here. This is what we did. Well, we had 6 in here before. Put 6 in here. That one's fine. That one's fine. 8's a problem. Which way does 8 need to rotate to make it balanced underneath it? Needs to go right. So you grab 7 and you hoist it up and you shake it out. And if 7 is above 8 and 6, 8 needs to go to the right of 7, 6 needs to stay to the left of 7, and you're done. And you're now balanced. 1, 2, good. 0, 0, 0, 0. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, we're OK. Get that? That's how we actually do this. I'll show you some more examples as well. Okay. Before I go into some, some more examples, it's exactly symmetric for the opposite left-left case. Or sorry, right-right case. For the right-right case, who needs to get balanced here? 
Who's, who's a problem? Which node is the problem? K1 is the problem. It needs to get shifted left. So you grab K2, shake it out. If you grab K2, K1 is less than K2. So therefore, it's going to be to the left of K2. OK? Uh, let's see. If you've got K2, you're going to say, OK, K1, or Y is related to K2, or Y is related to K1 is bigger. So it's got to be to the right of K1. And X still stays to the left of K1. And the only thing to the right of, of K2 is Z. OK, and it balances. Exactly the, the symmetrical case. OK? All right. So. Let me show you an example. Let me write these ones down so I know which ones to put in. 3, 2, 1, 4, oops, 4, 5, 6, 7. 3, 2, 1, 4, 5, 6, 7. OK. So I'm going to go to this web page here. This is an awesome web page. Let me write this down here. 3, 2, 1, 4, 5, 6, 7. OK. This web page, and you should write this down because it's got lots of different types of uh, lots of different types of. Um, let me move this up here. Hang on, move controls. There we go. This has lots of different uh, animations for you, and once you see these animations, you'll go, "Oh, I get it." Okay, this is an AVL tree, and I'm going to insert some nodes in here. Okay, I'm going to insert three, two, one, four, five, six, seven. OK, so if I insert 3, what it does is it actually is pretty fast. It'll go boop and insert it. You can tell it's 3. Now, it says what the height is of 3. The height is 1. From the root, the height is 1, basically. OK? Um, I like to make this a little bit slower so we can actually see what's going on. OK? Now we're going to put 2 in here. If we insert 2, where's it going to go? Left of 3, do we need to do any changes? No, because 3 will have 0 on one side and 1 on the other, and 2 will have 0 and 0, so we're good. Okay, if we insert 2, watch. It goes, it checks them, and it puts it there, and then it checks up, and it goes along. Okay? So now we've got 3 and 2, and nothing needs to be changed. Okay? If we put 1 in here, what's going to happen? Where's it going to go? 1 is going to go to the left of 2. Do we have a problem? Which one is the problem? Is 1 going to be a problem? No, because it's got 0 and 0. Is 2? 1 and 0, so it's fine. How about 3? 1, 2, and 0, we've got a problem. 3, 2, 1. Remember, 1 is going to be down here. Actually, I can probably stop it. We can, so I don't have to do this. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Insert, and I'm going to pause it when it gets down here. And it's going to put it there, and then boop. OK. So which one need, this is the one that has the problem. It's going to rotate which direction? To the right. OK, it's going to rotate to the right. So I grab on to 2, hoists it up. 3 ends up on the right of 2, and 1 ends up on the left. Let's see if that does that. OK. 3 is now the one that's the problem, so it's going to go whoop. And make that like that. Okay. All right. I'm going to add three, two, one, four. I'm going to add four. Is that one going to cause a problem? Okay. This is almost a little bit too slow. Oop, there we go. Okay. Four is not going to cause any problems, and you can count if you want. Two versus one. Three. Uh, sorry. One and two, and uh, one and zero, and zero and zero. We're fine. Okay. What was the next one? I did five. 6, 7. So 5 is going to go in. Where's 5 going to go? It's going to go here. Is there going to be a problem? Which one's going to be the problem? 3 is going to be the problem, not 2. Because 1, 2 versus 0. So first thing we're going to do is rotate this. Let's walk through it. Okay? Unfortunately, we're going to have to, I'm going to have to stop in a couple minutes about this. We'll get to the other rotation Wednesday. But let's see. If I put 5 in here, it's going to go down there, boom. Oh, OK, this is still too slow. Hold on. There we go. OK, so 5, OK, 5 is not a problem. 4 is not a problem, 1 and 0. 3, 1, 2 versus 0. 2 does have a problem, but we don't care about it yet. It turns out we'll solve that problem by fixing 3's first. 
Which one, where does 3 need to rotate? Left or right? right. Left. So which one do we grab onto? 4. We pull it up there. 3 goes on the left of 4. 5 goes on the right. Okay. So that's the one. And then it goes zoop like that. And notice now 2 is fixed. Zoe. That's for the left left. That is, the, OK, that's called a, uh, that is called a left rotate, uh, yes, a left rotation, because 3 needed to rotate to the left. Is that what you meant by left? Oh, uh, well, hold on. The left left insert, oops, ah, hang on. 4 was in there, and then 5, right? Speed this up, and then 5. This is actually a right right. Because, pause, oops, there we go, pause. Why is it a right right? Because this is the one that's screwed up, and it's the right subtree of the right child. What has to happen? 3 needs to rotate to the left to rebalance this. OK? It's starting to gel a little bit. Stuff's a little bit tricky, but it's starting to gel. OK, then, oh, we got to keep going here. And we have to rotate 3 to the left by grabbing onto 4, pulling it up, and we're good to go. 2 is fixed by the fact that we just solved 3's problem. OK, 6 goes in here. 6 goes in to the right of 5. Guess what? 1, 2, 3. Who's the problem? The problem is way up here on 2. OK, because you've got 1 and 1, 2, 3. It's the first one that has a problem. In fact, it's all the way at the root. If 2 is the problem, which way does 2 need to rotate? Left. OK, by grabbing onto 4. Now, this is the one where it gets a little bit, a little bit tricky. 4, you pull up here. 2 and 3 are going to fight, but the one that's going to uh, be directly to the left has to be the biggest, because everything below it has to be less. So it's going to be 3, and then 2. Right? And then 1. OK? Does that make sense? It's not right? Oh, sorry, you're right. I, I lied. Sorry, 2's got to be next because 3 has to go on the other side. Right? You're right. Sorry. Let's see what it does. Mm, there we go. Like that. We want to see that again? 6 is what we're putting in. OK. So it's going to go down. Do that. And that, and then we're going to put 6 there, go back up, go back up, go back up. We need a rotation. We're going to rotate around, and there you go. OK? 4 goes there. And we've fixed the, the tree. Now, if we put 7 in, is there going to be a problem? Uh, you're going to have a problem with 5, right? So 5, you're going to grab 6, and boop, like that. OK? Now notice, we inserted all those into the tree, and they all became nice and, a nice and balanced tree. OK? Yes, question? So could that whole like, lifting and shaking metaphor be, this, be described as, like, if, at least in the right, right case, that your parent's right tree needs to get your current left tree when you're like, yeah, probably. I, it's hard for me to think of it like that, but you probably could. Yeah, I like to think of it as just rotate the one that's rotate the one that's out of balance to the proper location. Okay, and that's that. We will go over the other. We'll go over the double rotation on Wednesday. Yeah, Ben. Yeah. Coding it out is tricky. I'm not going to make you guys code it out. You can go online and see the code for it. It is tricky. It's not, it's not, it's doable and it is logarithmic time, but it's not, it's not impossible. Okay? Any other questions? See you guys in lab or in thing. Come on up and ask the question. You got it.